I'm going to ask number nine. Uh, words that occur three times. As I read, you are going to come across the word desire and pleasure. They come three times, so mark it. And three times it says, you don't have, you don't have, you don't have. So you need to mark it in your Bible. Okay, so here we go. James chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. The Lord bless the reading of his holy word. It was very easy to give a title for these three verses, Conflict Within and Conflict Without. Why do we have church fights? I could have very easily titled this Church Fights, but that would be missing the point. <laughs> Why are there church fights? Because there is an internal conflict battle inside each one of us. So I want to break this down under four headings. And number one, the realm of conflict. The realm of conflict. And verse one gives us the answer. And again, you may want to underline these two sets of words. Verse one, among you, within you. That's the realm of conflict. Within you, among you. First, there is a fight inside of me and that spills over and affects others in the local fellowship. I'm always tempted to ask when there are church conflicts, I want to ask the people, what's the battle going on inside of you? Because that is what is spilling out in this uh, war in the church. The inside conflict breathes an evil desire that explodes into conflict in the local church. <laughs> now this word uh, desire needs to be defined. The word desire, the word crave, the word pleasure. You can use any of those three words. Uh, the words are neutral words. Desire, crave, pleasure are neutral words. It all depends on the context. There is what is called legitimate pleasure. And then of course there is what is called illegitimate pleasure. Let me explain. So yesterday I was at a graduation event. And uh, my goodness, we got a sumptuous meal. But uh, before the meal, the host put into my hands an ice cold coconut water can, the big one. And I just loved it. In the heat, it was just a wonderful pleasure, a legitimate pleasure. And then when the meal finished, uh, the host said, oh, we have ice cream and we have the Indian ice cream. Is it Kulfi? Kulfi, strawberry brand. So I wanted to be uh, disciplined. So I took two small spoons. You've got to believe me on this. I took two small spoons just to savor it and it was absolutely yummy, second only to nut and fruit ice cream that I tasted in Colombo, very close second. Now I had hardly closed and opened my eyes when the host saw that my cup was empty and she came and dumped a whole heap of further kulfi ice cream into my little container. So I had to eat, <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was legitimate pleasure. Now you can watch a beautiful sunset. That is legitimate pleasure. You can listen to soothing music and that is legitimate pleasure. You don't have to feel guilty about it. But then there is what is called illegitimate pleasure. So the context decides whether the word is the positive or the negative, right? Now, you and I know that uh, we all fight uh, a war on three fronts. 
the first front is in internal the the sinful cravings the sinful desires the sinful pleasures wanting to eat the forbidden fruit so this morning uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I was uh, speaking at a Chinese church and I told them uh, when I was in school, uh, you know, these tortoises, they, they, they come into your play area. So what some of us guys did was we used to take the uh, big candles, light it, and we used to uh, fix it on the shell of the tortoise. And all of a sudden the tortoise feels the heat and it puts its feet out and it runs for dear life. The dogs in the compound are chasing these tortoise and we are running behind, you know, sadistic pleasure. That is what is called sadistic pleasure, right? Illegitimate pleasure. If it was Canada, I would have been put behind bars for cruelty to animals, right? So, again, a little example of how this battle rages inside of us where we want to express the sinful cravings. But the second level where we uh, experience the war is we are living in an anti-God world system that is not helping us one bit. So this anti-God world system exerts tremendous pressure on all of us to conform to its ways, to do what it wants us to do and to engage in sinful pleasure. And then of course at the third front is a whole army of demons that are there to bring about your destruction and my destruction. They tempt us, they bait us, and they want us to, uh, uh, to uh, just give in to sin and to destroy ourselves. <laughs> so whether you realize it or not, there are battles on three fronts. My internal cravings, and then of course the world system, and the demonic system. So... James, very under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is defining for us the realm of the conflict. First of all, it is within you, and then it spills out into the local fellowship among you. That's always the order, right? Secondly, the second point, the reason for the conflict. The reason for the conflict is that uh, because of this relentless inner cravings that I have, I want to satisfy it in the wrong way. One preacher put it this way, it is an internal war of unbridled passions. Uh, that's a loaded statement. Internal war of unbridled passions. So these uh, internal cravings want to take control. They want to dominate. They want to uh, lead our life in a wrong path and you and i face that every day every time you watch something on tv you go to the internet right uh you look at a magazine you uh, uh just look at society around you <laughs> there is something inside of you that says you know there is something on offer here if i were to take it it's going to bring me a degree of satisfaction and it will except that there is a terrible guilt complex that comes afterwards and there are severe kickbacks. There are severe kickbacks. My uh, neighbor <laughs> is a great guy. I mean, uh, very helpful, but he can't speak English too well, but very good. I mean, you can get anything done through the guy. But uh, I always notice he has stacks of bottles uh, outside his uh, back door. And out of curiosity, I go and check the labels and they are all heavy duty, alcoholic, uh, drinks and the guy is consuming it in the night time right but he is well behaved <laughs> he probably takes it and goes to sleep and so he's not creating any problems for anyone but i said to myself how sad here is a guy who is intelligent who is very productive very capable very skilled and uh, look at the way he is self-destructing through the use of all these alcoholic drinks and all kinds of different brands which I've never ever known in my life uh, before. And one day I want to talk to him, but the problem is communication, right? So these uh, wantings and uh, cravings and desires uh, are wanting to dominate our life. And uh, you have a little, it always says, have more. You take a little, have more. You take a little, have more. So that's why if you take pornography, I learned this through a 13-year-old boy, you enter into it at a soft core level, 
and before you know it you are at the more heavy duty level for which you pay big money and uh, because that appetite has been aroused and you are not satisfied with what you have seen here you want more dirty stuff and more dirty stuff and more dirty stuff to, to satisfy that internal craving our bodies are a battlefield of wants and desires. That's why advertisers capitalize on that. I have mentioned this to you before. Warden and Elsmere, there was a huge uh, advertisement, massive one, with one word. One word. The whole advertisement was a big chocolate bar. And you know, they had opened it and all the juice coming out in that, uh, in that advertisement, in that uh, billboard. And one word written across it, indulge. And honestly, I wanted to stop my car, go to the closest convenience store and buy that particular brand of chocolate because it appealed to me. It appealed to my internals. And it was passing a powerful message to me. If you indulge this, you are going to find some satisfaction. That's why the Christian life is a life of tremendous discipline learning to say no and i'm going to show you a verse for that uh, which is going to be one of the victory verses that we are going to look at uh, today so i want to introduce you to four people in the bible who uh, uh, could not control these internal cravings and they come in four different uh, aspects or four different directions Herod displays to us the love of sinful pleasure sexual pleasure I don't have to go into any gross details. You know the story. So Herod is an example of someone who gave in to the sexual appetites of his body. And uh, I don't know about the ladies, but for the men, the sexual drive is very powerful. Very powerful. It dominates uh, uh, our thinking. And uh, Pastor Sundar Krishnan once preached a, a series on the theme sexual sanity four messages that was the best-selling cassette tapes in that church and outside for the longest time when i went on my trip to uh, nigeria to speak to students i introduced them to sexual sanity and it was the most requested four set message uh, by men because it was challenging a critical area of their life uh, you can access those four messages if you go to the Exhale Alliance Church website. Sexual Sanity, SS. And for all the men here, I would strongly recommend that you would listen to those four messages and lot of practical advice given uh, for your spiritual health and for my spiritual health. So that's error. The second is, of course, Judas. And his problem was love of money. There was the internal craving for more money, more money, more money. And he was willing to betray his Lord just to get a little extra money. The third person is a, a very godly king by the name of Hezekiah. And he was guilty of the love of display. He put everything on his kingdom on display to the enemy. And the enemy came and saw everything they took... Uh, uh, they took uh, photographs on their cell phones and uh, when they went back, they were able later to come and attack and take all these, uh, uh, all these uh, stuff that Hezekiah had put on display. Basically, Hezekiah was saying, come and look at the richness of my kingdom. And he showed them the treasury and all the items that were uh, there in uh, his kingdom. So the love of display. The fourth guy... <laughs> The passage uh, that was uh, read, uh, Judges, is a dude by the name of uh, Adonai Bezek. If you, if you want a sadistic guy in the Bible, this would be the dude. By the way, dude is a good word. You can go to Google and check it. Uh, I checked it before I used it. It's a modern term used by young people, dude. Uh, just like how they use the word yo. Uh, do they still use the word yo? Yo is gone out of fashion now. Yo. <laughs> And uh, so what did this guy do, this Adonai Basek, he captured 70 kings. He didn't kill them. He cut off their big toes and the thumbs and got them to crawl under his food table like dogs and pick up whatever crumbs that fell off the table. 
a very sadistic approach. And then, of course, uh, he was captured and, uh, and his toes and thumbs uh, were cut off. <laughs> uh, God exacting vengeance on this guy for what he did. So his problem was the love of power. Look how powerful I am. I have captured 70 kings. I didn't kill them, but I cut out their toes and their uh, thumbs so that they become useless. And uh, I recently talked to a lady who had to have three toes amputated on a foot. And I said, how does it feel? Emotionally, how does it feel? And she said, it's very tough emotionally, but worst thing, physically. You need help to walk around. Otherwise, you lose balance. You can fall. So, so it has all kinds of repercussions uh, when uh, parts of your body are amputated. And then Diotrephus is a guy in the New Testament. <laughs> he was actually an elder in the church. He was kind of a big guy in the church. And his love was the love of preeminence. The craving inside of him was be number one, be number one, be number one. Step on others, put others down. You be number one. So these are some examples from the Bible as to how the cravings inside of us expresses itself in very bizarre ways and creates a lot of problems. Now here is another statement given by a, a, a pastor. In our day today, an insatiable thirst for pleasure is destroying our thirst for the things of God. You and I can sit and watch a three-hour movie and we can watch another three-hour movie and yet struggle to spend 10 minutes reading the Bible. An insatiable pleasure, uh, desire for pleasure has robbed us of our vitality in our relationship with God. How true? True in my life, true in your life. Now I'm going to introduce you to four Bible verses which addresses this whole issue of the internal cravings and desires and how we deal with it. The first one is from 1 Peter 2.11 and I'm going to ask you to underline a key, key word in this verse. Put a square bracket around this word because this is the defeat victory word in your life and my life. So 1 Peter 2.11 Beloved, I beg you, <laughs> imagine Peter begging the people in the church, I beg you, I plead with you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain, there is your word, abstain. Now unfortunately, modern translations, I don't think they use the word abstain, they use alternate words. But thank God for the good old King James Version, which comes through where this verse is concerned. Abstain. You know what abstain means? Learn to say no. You want to be more polite? No. Thank you. No, thank you. Sorry. Can't take it. Sorry. I'm bound by an oath to God. <laughs> I can't take this. I can't do this. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. There's a battle for the soul. And these internal cravings are trying to gain control, gain mastery of the soul. And uh, they do so by engaging you in this battle and uh, getting you to compromise, getting you to say yes when you should be saying no. But by the way, this applies to sleep. I don't know about you, at this stage in my life, I say to myself, I'm justified to sleep a little longer. I'm justified to sleep a little longer. Suddenly, uh, while I'm on bed, I say to myself, what am I doing? I'm wasting time. I should get out. I should jump out. I should be doing something constructive with my time. So I go, I wash my face, have a, a little tea, and I start doing something productive. You've got to learn to say no to the love of sleep in order that I can utilize that time for something very productive. Right? For all you young bucks, six hours of sleep is more than what you need. So I love to call you all on a Saturday morning. What are you doing? Sleeping in. Sleeping in? What did you do on Friday night? Watch three movies, one after the other, put pizza. So what is that going to do to your soul? It's going to make me a spiritual pauper. 
going to make me a spiritual pauper. That's what it does. Okay? Now here's the second verse. We looked at this in James chapter 1. Okay? Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. Underline those three words. Our own evil desires are dragging us away. They are enticing us. They look very pleasurable, very appetizing. Then after desire has conceived, same word in chapter 4, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown, gives birth to death. When we studied this passage, uh, there are two images that James is using. One is the fisherman and the other is the hunter. And the fisherman is with his fishing rod and there is a bait with a hook unseen by the fish. And all what the fish sees is the worm and it grabs the worm and in that whole process it is entrapped and it is killed. <laughs> Same thing with the hunting term. Okay, there is a trap set for an animal and this animal doesn't see the trap and it falls into the trap, it is captured and uh, it is eaten, right? Hunting or fishing. Now, Romans 13, 13 and 14, I think are two verses all of us should memorize. This is your summer project. Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. Let us walk properly, decently, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality. These are the internal cravings, the passions, unbridled passions that want control. And Paul is saying, don't give in to it. Don't give in to it. Not in quarreling and jealousy. Those are the two words that James is going to use in James chapter 4. So Paul and James are in agreement. You know, if we don't control our passions, it's going to lead to quarreling and fighting and disharmony in the local fellowship. Then he gives the solution. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Don't place yourself in the path of temptation. I must not place myself in the path of temptation. So, the story is told of a guy who was overweight and his problem was he goes to a bakery and he buys all the junk food. So he made a decision that he was not going to go that particular route. And uh, so he, he, he was victorious. He lost some pounds and everyone applauded him and they said, oh, you're doing very good. And then one day he came to the office with a lot of these forbidden food goodies. Just like at SIM on a Friday when I walk in, there's a dear lady from Whitby. She will bring a lot of forbidden foods. And she will say, Pastor Benji, feast. And uh, oh my goodness, what a battle I face uh, on the Friday mornings. Pray for me on the Friday mornings. I can lose it <laughs> if I'm not careful. So, so this guy said, you know, the people were shocked. Hey, you were doing so well. But what happened? He said, no, no. I uh, just uh, decided I'm going to uh, drive around that old route. And I prayed a prayer, God, if you really want me to stop and pick up something, uh, may there be a parking space right in, right by the side of the front door. So he said, that's what happened. I drove around for eight times till I found the parking spot right in front of the parking uh, in, in the door. And I went in, hey, you're making a fool of yourself. You didn't stick to your game plan. Whom are you trying to please, right? So we need to come up with a game plan. Make no provision for the flesh, for the sinful cravings, for the evil desires that are lurking deep within our soul. Don't walk the path of temptation, right? Learn to say no, and you and I can be victorious. Galatians 5.16, here's another secret for winning. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Every day come under the control, un under the presidency of the Blessed Holy Spirit. As I jump out of bed, my first prayer is a prayer of confession. And my second prayer is a prayer asking the Holy Spirit to totally govern my life for the day. To govern my thinking, my actions, my words, 
to come under his total dominance. And that's the way we kill uh, the desires of the flesh. So, the reason for the conflict is those internal desires, that internal pull that you feel wanting to do that which is forbidden. Now we come to the third point, the result of the conflict. And in order to explain the result of the conflict, I want to quote to you the verse that we looked at last Sunday. Demonic wisdom, divine wisdom. So divine wisdom, the wisdom that comes from heaven is peace loving and peacemakers are sowing seeds of peace with the hope of reaping a harvest of righteousness. So every day of our life, you and I should be seeking to sow those seeds of peace with the hope of reaping a harvest of righteousness. Now, if I don't sow seeds of peace, the result is going to be quarrels and troubles. James uses that set of words two times in three verses, quarrels and fight. Now one word, quarrel, means armed conflict, a state of war, <laughs> like what we see happening in the Ukraine right now. This word fights are sudden outbursts of passion which occurs during a state of war. You know, there can be a lull in the war. I remember in our 25-year civil war in Sri Lanka, there were times when there was a lull in the war. You could get about, you could get a few things done. There was no open hostility. And all of a sudden, without warning, my goodness, that finishes and there is full-scale warfare. So that's true spiritually. If I don't bridle my passions at an unguarded moment, these uh, passions are going to express itself very violently and it's going to do a lot of damage. A lot of damage. Have you seen people who get so angry and there is such a terrible outburst coming from them, sometimes things can get thrown around in the whole process, and all of a sudden they quiet down and they speak so sweetly and if the phone rings, they answer it and they say, how are you? And you wonder, is it the same person? Only a few minutes ago, they were expressing themselves violently now they have become as sweet as you fill in the blank. <laughs> right? They have given vent to their internal craving, passion, and now they are at peace with, the, with themselves and they look at you and say, what's wrong with you, brother Sam? What's wrong with you? And you are saying, hey, you had an angry outburst just a moment ago. Shouldn't you be asking the question of yourself, why did I do that? They are right and everyone else in the world is wrong. So there was a dad and he had a little daughter and the little daughter was playing with her playmates and they were having a heated quarrel. So the dad stepped in and reprimanded his daughter and said, you know, you guys should be learning to play uh, nicely, decently. Uh, and, the, and the daughter said, dad, don't, don't worry, just relax. We were playing church. That's what the daughter had seen in church. And that's what she was now playing with her playmates. All the quarrels and all the fights that take place in the average local church. By the way, when there are quarrels and fights that spill over into a church, you can smell the stench as you walk into that church. I have been to a lot of churches in my lifetime. And there are churches I've walked in, I said to myself, there's something wrong here. I mean, no one spoke to me. You could sense the tension. You could, uh, you could smell the foulness. There's something wrong here. And uh, I pray that that will never happen to us. Uh, that we will always learn to deal with disagreements and dissensions and divisions and disputes. Clear they are so that there's always a sweet aroma that is uh, found in our fellowship. So the result is, according to verse 2, unsatisfied, unfulfilled pleasure. 
three times in one verse, verse 2, James is saying, you don't have, you don't have, you don't get. You have these cravings and you are trying to fulfill them, but you are not fulfilled. Uh, uh, you, you, are, you, you are craving for more and more and more. And the Lord Jesus spoke a parable, the parable of the four soils, and uh, the one that represented the thorns. The Lord Jesus said, the pleasures of this life choke out the effectiveness of the word of God. So why is it that I am not getting more out of the scriptures? Why is it that I really don't have a passion for the Bible? Why is it that I get bored during sermon time? Why is it that I yawn? Why is it that my thoughts go all over the place? Why is it that I am not engaged in a sermon? The answer could well be that there are internal cravings in your heart that you have not dealt with and that's stifling the effectiveness of the word of God in your life and my life. So, the pleasures of life, the illegitimate pleasures of life, choking out the word of God. Now, the next point I am going to say is very difficult. James says, you covet, you don't have, now watch the words, so you kill. I read a lot of commentaries on this and I have called it the unbelievable extreme. The unbelievable extreme because of these unbridled passions in the heart, could it lead to murder? Most of the commentaries try to downplay it, soft pedal it and say, oh, what they are talking about is character assassination. But if you take it for what it says, it's not character assassination. It is literal murder. If you look at the Old Testament, you have a classic example of this. The man after God's own heart, David. He had, eight, he had eight wives, in case you didn't know it. Eight wives. So at least you think you would have your internal cravings under control with eight wives. Right? Solomon outdid him. I won't even mention the number. Staggering. So, David gave in to the cravings of his heart. He coveted after a beautiful woman and he murdered the husband of this woman in order to take her to be his wife. He paid a heavy price. David paid a heavy price, but he killed. He killed. And uh, so you have an example in the Old Testament of killing, literal killing. Now if you take the Matthew 5 passage, where the Lord Jesus Christ uh, talks about anger, uh, Matthew 5.21, intense hatred equals murder, the Lord Jesus Christ said. Intense hatred in my heart, I haven't killed anyone physically, but the Lord Jesus said it equals murder. It's as good as though you have killed the person. So whatever way you cut this, <laughs> it is very serious, it is very solemn. That if the internal cravings are not dealt with, it can lead to actual murder. Worst case scenario, such bitter, intense hatred in your heart that you become unlivable. Try living with a person who has intense hatred in their heart. You can't live with a person. You can't. Right? So that's the result. They are unsatisfied. They are unfulfilled. And they can go to unbelievable extremes, even to the point of killing. So in your core groups, you may want to discuss that. Uh, how does that apply to us? Now, number four, the remedy for conflict. And you know, when I, when I studied this passage, I said to myself, it can't be this simple. It can't be this simple. <laughs> in one word, the remedy for internal conflict, spilling out into... Uh, external conflict, one word, prayer. One word, prayer. And James brings it out in verses 2 and 3. You don't have because you never ask for it. <laughs> the greatest tragedy, now listen very carefully, the greatest tragedy in life 
is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. That statement hit me like a two by four when I first uh, read it. The greatest tragedy is not unanswered prayer. We all complain about unanswered prayer, right? But the greatest tragedy is unoffered prayer. Now I have learned to ask a question from people when they come with their problems. I look at them and say, did you pray about it? They say, no, no, that's why we came to you. I said, no, that's not what I'm asking. Did you pray about it? And the answer nine out of ten times is no. So that's why you're still in the mess. You never took prayer seriously. You never fasted and prayed over the issue that you are having in your life. And that's why you are living as a slave to those cravings. And James so beautifully put it in James 1.17, isn't it? Every good gift and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow of turning. God loves to give us good, perfect, healthy gifts. And if I go to him and ask him for those gifts, he will give it to me so that I will be totally satisfied and I don't have to give in to the cravings of my sinful pleasure. Right? So learn to ask from the Lord good gifts, life-giving gifts, healthy gifts that will undercut all the cravings, the sinful cravings uh, within your heart. Prayer is not an easy way of getting what we want, but the only way of becoming what God wants us to be. I, I, that's a lesson that took me a long time to learn. Prayer is not going to God with a grocery list and saying, hey God, here are 10 things, you better come true for me. And when the church has the testimony time on Wednesdays, I should be able to testify and say, you gave me what I asked for. No, no, no. That's not it. In prayer, my mask comes off. I'm the real me. I can't pretend. I'm before God, one-on-one, -on -one, and God is going to deal with my internal. And God says, there are a lot of things wrong in your life. You've got to change. You've got to give up this. You've got to give up this. You've got to give up this. And I, uh, I'm being conformed to the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we call it the untapped potential, and that's called prayer. The untapped potential, prayer. I like what Miles Monroe said, prayer gives earthly license for heaven's interference. Don't you love a statement like that? Prayer gives earthly license for heaven to interfere and to intervene in your affairs. So the first uh, sin that uh, James is going to point out is the sin of prayerlessness. You don't have, you don't have because you didn't take time to pray about it. Did you talk to the Lord about it? Did I talk to the Lord about it? If there is one area that I want to grow more and more and more, it is the realm of prayer. And I'm sure all of you would agree with that. If all of you look, take a good look at your life, you will all confess and say, my prayer life is in shambles. I hardly pray. I hardly pray. My prayer life is not growing. And uh, so what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? And I'm going to teach you a very simple way as we close today as to how you can enhance your prayer life. Right? We'll come to that in a moment. Let's all confess to the Lord, myself included, the sin of prayerlessness. Now, prayer is hard work. Satan relentlessly attacks it. And for me, I found that uh, if I sit in a chair or I, uh, or I attempt to kneel, I'll fall asleep. I don't know about you, for me, it's a recipe for sleep. So I have learned now to walk and pray. So I walk in a safe area because you've got to keep your eyes open when you walk, otherwise you'll bump into a tree and Sam will have to come and see me in hospital. So you keep your eyes open. But you're focused, you concentrate and you pray and uh, I have found it to work very well for me. 
uh, I do a lot of praying on my massage chair in the gym. Gives you 20 minutes. And you just put it on and you go. You just lie low, lie back and you start praying. 20 minutes of uninterrupted prayer. So <laughs> you don't have to kneel all the time. You don't have to sit in a chair all the time. You can walk around. You can write out prayers. I encourage people to write out prayers. In my journal, I do a lot of prayers. One sentence prayers. Not one page, but one sentence prayers. Addressing the internal cravings of my heart. So if I come to visit you, will you be able to show me your journal and say, Pastor, look, I'm growing. Look at how I'm growing in prayer. I'm growing in the word. I'm not bored at God. I'm not bored with scripture. I don't yawn during a sermon time. I don't get distracted because I'm engaged. I'm fully engaged with God. The Holy Spirit is actively at work in my life. I am fully engaged. Sin of prayerlessness. <laughs> and then James says, oh yeah, but some of you do pray. But the problem is they are selfish prayers. You're praying with the wrong motives. You're, you have a consumer mentality. It's all about the grocery list. All about the grocery list. Right? So, <laughs> let me give you now the template that you can use. And we, have to go, we don't have to go too far. It's the Lord's Prayer. I'm really coming to appreciate the Lord's Prayer in a greater way. You know, I grew up in a church... Uh, denomination where we did away with the Lord's Prayer. When I was in school, Anglican school, we always had to recite the Lord's Prayer. But then it became a kind of a meaningless repetition. And then we did away with it altogether in our evangelical churches and we have become the losers as a result. So, here is the Lord's Prayer that you can use, I can use, to gain victory over the internal, sinful cravings, passions, pleasures, so that I can be pure in God's eyes and I can be very harmonious with my fellow brothers and sisters in the local fellowship. Right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Talk to God about your relationship with him, honor him and worship him. That's where it all starts. Worshipping God, adoring God, honouring God. That's where it all begins. Right? So, uh, uh, alternate exercise I would encourage you to do over the two summer months. Go through a study on the names of God. My goodness, you just go to Google, you'll get tons of material. Names of God. And take those names of God and use it in your personal prayer. Right? And you can then worship God in spirit and in truth. And you can honor him. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Talk to God about his agenda for the earth. Which means that you and I are going to pray for our city. We are going to pray for our pastors in our churches, for our nation and for our leaders. God's agenda for the earth. So tomorrow is voting day. Many of us here have the opportunity to vote. And I hope you do go out and you do vote. Exercise that right. Prayerfully. Prayerfully. Because these leaders are going to determine the course of your city and the spiritual climate of the uh, city. Now the area where I live, I uh, do support a certain party and uh, that party is in power and uh, so uh, uh, they sent me an email and uh, just uh, wanting to find out how I'm doing and uh, uh, and then uh, they said oh we would like to plant a, a lawn sign uh, are you okay with that I said yeah I'm okay with that I support you so I have no problems in my neighborhood knowing uh, who I voted for and within 24 hours man they brought the uh, on sign and they brought a bag with unbelievable goodies inside of it. I mean, if for nothing else, it's well worth sending an email just to get that bag of goodies. So much of stuff 
And I sent them a thank you note. I said, I didn't expect all this stuff. And they said, no, this is our appreciation because you care about our party and what we stand for and you're a supporter. And so we want to bless you with it. So now I'm getting a close connection with the party and with some individuals. And it has to happen that way. That is God's agenda for the earth, right? That's why every Wednesday, if you notice very carefully, I pray for Prime Minister Trudeau. I pray for Premier Ford. I pray for all our premiers. I pray for all the mayors. Why? That is God's agenda for the earth. And you and I play a big part in it through our prayers and through our getting to know the political people on the stage and whom we are going to support. Give us today our daily bread. <laughs> Ask God for your needs. I have listed six needs that all of us have in life. It's all in your notes or on the screen. Six needs. We ask God to fulfill our spiritual needs, our physical needs, our material needs, our emotional needs, our relational needs, and for many of you, your educational needs. Well, that is in the context of the Lord's Prayer. If you take those six needs itself, it will take you six minutes to pray for each one of them. And you say you don't pray? Your prayer life is just two minutes? Something wrong. Terribly wrong. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Talk to God about all the relationships in your life. Starting with your parents, your siblings, your relatives, those within the local church fellowship, right, in the community, right? And um, you talk to God about forgiveness, if you need to extend forgiveness to anyone, right? I had a pretty difficult neighbor, not easy to get along with him. And uh, I prayed, I tried my best to be as nice and polite as I possibly could with him. And then the unbelievable happened last Saturday uh, because of the, the ice storm that we had in the winter. A lot of my fir trees were bent in two like this. And he came to me and he said, I noticed that your trees are all bent in two. I'm a physics guy. I can help those trees to stand erect. I, I couldn't. He said, Mama Mia, what am I hearing here? Right? I said, yes, sir. Yes. You're a physics expert. Uh, I did very poorly in physics at school because of you blame the teachers, right? I had terrible teachers and I didn't do too well in. Uh, he said, no, no, that's okay. And he, I, but I said, sir, I don't have the ropes. I said, I have all the ropes. And he came and with my help, he tied everything together. He put stakes and everything is now in an upright position. And uh, I said, whoa, after so many months and years of prayer, he has become my friend. And now I wave at him and he waves back. He has become as cool as cucumber. Right? That's what it means about talking about relationships. I have very good relationships with a lot of my neighbors. And uh, one, of the, one of my neighbors is a young fellow with deep depression. He used to walk around with a dog. The dog died and from that day this guy has not got off his bed. So I talked to one of my neighbors who is in close touch with that family and I said, look, can't we do something? Can't, can't I come and pray with this guy? And uh, so, so, I mean, you get involved in your neighborhood. You get involved with the people. Hey, summer, two months, you're going to see them outside. Don't ignore them. Don't ignore them. Say, hi, how are you? My name is Benjamin. What's your name? Chris. Oh, Chris, you've got a lovely dog. Yeah, it's a good dog. My wife bought it. I had to look after it. <laughs> you get good humor also without having to watch movies, right? <laughs> so I, anyway, I'm enjoying this, so I don't know about you. Lead us not into temptation. Talk to God about your weaknesses and areas of vulnerability. All of us have areas where we are vulnerable. We'll easily fall. We'll easily topple and fall. Talk to the Lord about it. Identify that area, whatever that area is, and talk to God about it. God, I'm so weak in this area. 
God, I will so easily collapse under the pressure in this particular area. Will you not help me? Will you not empower me? Will you not uh, bring a support team around me to help me? Do you talk to God about your weaknesses? Your areas of vulnerability? And then, this is a prayer that I have really come to appreciate. Deliver us from evil. Deliver me from the evil one, Satan, and deliver me from all the evil that is so prevalent around me. Talk to God about things that may have become a stronghold in your life. Right? Satan first begins with a toe hole. The toe hole becomes a foothold, and the foothold becomes a stronghold. That's how Satan works. Toe hold is a small area. He gains control over a small area of your life. If you don't deal with it, it becomes a foothold, much bigger. Stronghold is where he establishes a fortress, he plants his flag, his flag is flying. So what are the strongholds in your life and my life? <laughs> I've given you a little uh, list here. Sugar. Sugar. Caffeine. Sugar and caffeine? Yeah. When I was in Australia, my younger brother, bless his dear heart, he put a no to all sugar, either in the coffee or tea. So his dear wife, when he's looking the other way, would quickly come and put a little sugar into my, uh, <laughs> into my cup of tea or whatever. But that was cheating. So now I would say 75% I can drink coffee and tea without sugar. Right? So those are habits that we build into our life. Because we want to be free. We want to be free. And uh, any obsession that you may have with someone or something. That's a stronghold in your life. An obsession that you have with a person or with a thing. And you cry out to God in prayer and say, Oh God, deliver me. Set me free. I am the captive. Break this bondage. Break this stronghold. Where do, we have, uh, where do we hear prayers like that today? All our prayers are bless me prayers and nice sweet prayers that we pray. Right? And I need to begin with me. And then just like how we began with worship, the final statement is, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So I have learned to proclaim these four G words at the end of my prayers. Proclaim God's goodness, His greatness, His glory, His grace. As you wind up your prayer time, wind it up the way you began. Worship, adoration, and now you focus specifically on God's greatness, goodness, grace, glory. How radical this prayer is. How revolutionary this prayer is. If we take it seriously, and if we apply it to our life so that we can be set free of the internal conflicts that rage in your soul and my soul, it's a battlefield which spills over to others. Around. It will spill over to those in the family circle and then it will spill over anywhere else, workplace and also in the local church. So we are going to pray. <laughs> sin of prayerlessness and selfish pray we want to pray right so let's pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name may your kingdom come may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, we are going to sing another hymn in closing. <laughs>